we have a couple things we're going to do. And the first thing we're going to do is we are going to honor my grandpa who passed away. Tomorrow will be one year. That's the reason I'm wearing this shirt. I'm not doing free oil changes after service. Um, he actually ran his own um, express loop for Texaco for, I mean, 20 years, I think. Um, and so we share the same name. Also, if you don't know, my first name is Ronald. A lot of people, it's new to them. Um, so it works out. But he gave each one of the grandsons one of these um, shirts. And so I feel like it's a, a great day to wear it. Um, so I'm going to have my mom come on up because we actually today frame uh, the schematic that he drew out for this very building that we're in today before um, it is what it is now. So it is a little different on there, but I'm going to have her hold it just so we can look. So what happened was my grandma passed away a couple years ago, and so he um, decided to kind of invest into more of you know, the grandchildren and stuff. So he was out here a lot when we moved out here. Um, it was a lot more than we had ever seen him. He got very close to our kids. Um, and so he was at our house a lot, and he would, um, you know, you know, we went over kind of what we wanted the building to look like, and every night he'd be sitting at the table for hours, and he'd just be feeling, and you could see his handwriting, you know, and you can't read hardly any of it, but it's just, you know, everything. And every day that we would, come, he would come in here with us, and every day that we would make a change, he would go home and he'd make the change to it. You could see he's added each date that he, uh, made a change to it. We have four or five of them, but this was the most legible one. Um, but it's just awesome to see. You know, we wouldn't have started the Sunday we did if it wasn't for him. You know, it was Josiah, myself, uh, yeah. Tom, Paige's dad, he's in here somewhere, uh, right here, and Grandpa Ron. And so he, every time he came through, um, he would be here, you know, for a weekend or some days, and he'd be in here busting a hump. I mean, in the middle of the heat, you know, sweating his butt off, working, uh, but made sure, you know, he saw the vision and he, you know, trusted us and, you know, he saw what we were doing here. So uh, we have a picture of him and his schematic that we're going to frame here in the office for, you know, just a, an awesome example of legacy and, and, you know, why we're here today. So it's awesome. our church in Manning, California. He was our CFO, and um, actually, he was the CFO until he took his last breath on earth. And so he he really pioneered all this work with us. And, um, and every time Ken would come to him with a crazy idea, he was right there in, in it to win it. <laughs> you know, he was like, okay, let's do it. Let's go, let's do it. And so I wanna encourage you all to um, just grab a hold of that faith. You know, when um, when God gives someone a vision next to you and they say, hey, what do you think of this? Grab their hand and say, okay, let's do it. You know, step out in faith. Um, your life will never be boring and God will always come through and it'll just build your faith. So um, thank you all for being here and this is beautiful. Um, we buried him and my mom last weekend and it was wonderful. Thank you. I know that Grandpa Ron would hate every minute of this. He did not like to be acknowledged or have any of those things. Um, and I know that he wouldn't want us to mourn him, but he would want us to live um, life, you know, the way that he knows God called us to. So, um, with that, we also, um, obviously today is 9-11, so it's a, it's a couple, you know, heavy things after another. Uh, but today we remember the largest terrorist attack on U.S. soil, resulting in the loss of almost 3,000 American lives. Um, and we also remember today the planned attack on our U.S. diplomatic compound and a nearby CIA annex in Benghazi, Libya, resulting in the death of four American lives. Um, both of them happened on 9-11. Uh, both of them were the result of lives lost. And so today, you know, we remember those. And we also remember the fact that um, in 9-11-2012, there was an opportunity to save people. And for a moment of your life, if you ever think that your government cares about you, it's time for a reality check. Amen. At the end of the day, whatever lines pockets and whatever helps their agenda, they're going to do. And so it's important that we understand the community of people around us. Yeah. We understand the truth of the gospel. And we understand that our lives 
is not to depend on anybody but Jesus Christ himself, and that's it. The moment we find ourselves depending on a government, is no matter what side you're on, is the moment it all starts going awry. And so at the end of the day, we know who our Savior is, and we know who has the final word over us, and it's Jesus Christ, and that's it. So, again, we remember, though, because lives were lost, and that's the reality of it. No matter how it came about, um, people lost their lives, and so... You know, we, we do take time, and, and it's important that we don't forget those things because those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. So it's important that we know that. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9 says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. I felt like that was a great verse that encapsulates what this country is. Um, it's a country of freedom to do what we do, and there's a reason that... Uh, we don't all have English accents in here today it's because some people grabbed a hold of a vision and said, we're not going to let people tell us what to do anymore. And that's why we have the freedoms we do today. And so I'm darn glad that we do because I just don't like the English accents. <laughs> but it's interesting. We started a revolution over 2% tax on tea, and yet we pay you know, 10%, 15% tax on everything else in this country. So again, there's going to come a time where it's time to put the foot down, um, and it's coming quick. So... Um, but God is good, amen? Amen. That was my rant for the day. That one's free. The next one's going to cost you. All right, so today, as we get into our series, we are in the book of Romans. Our series is called Justified. We are in Romans chapter 6 today, and we're in verses 1 through 10. And it's going to be awesome because all 10 of these verses, you could probably preach an hour on each one of them. And so last week... Originally, if you weren't here, we celebrated our one-year anniversary of being open in this building. And originally, I was going to have our very own Blake Broadway speak, but we decided that you know God was leading us to go a different direction. If you were here, it was awesome. We heard from people in this community, uh, from the community of California that came here, but we just heard some testimonies and, and what this ministry has meant to them. Um, so now this week, I get to steal Blake's message and preach on Romans 6. I'm sorry, but uh, like I told him, the good pastors do their own stuff. The great ones steal it from somebody else. And so thank you, Blake. Um, <laughs> but let's jump in today. Uh, verse 1 says this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And this is huge. And this is super important that we stop here and think about it. Because that's the first thing that somebody says when you say, yeah, you know, we are... We are not only a grace church, we are hyper grace because that's the gospel. And so the first thing somebody hears or says when they hear that is, well, grace is just a license to sin. We've all heard that before. Man, you know, grace is just a license to go out and do whatever you want. So that's what Paul's saying. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we just do more bad because we know that it'll just come with more grace? From a purely natural or secular viewpoint, grace is dangerous. This is why many people don't really teach or believe in grace and instead emphasize living by law. They believe that if you tell people that God saves and accepts them apart from what they deserve, then they will have no motive to be obedient. In their opinion, you simply can't keep people on a straight and narrow without a threat from God hanging over their head. If they believe their position in Jesus is settled because of what Jesus did, then the motivation of holy living is gone. And that's the law. That's people that are bound by legalism and this understanding. They're, man, I can't tell people how free they really are because then the seats won't be full. I got to hang over. Hey, you know, you never know. God might come and get you. So everybody, you know, has that check in the back of their mind, keeps the seats full, keeps me feeling like I'm doing a, a dang good job. And then this is awesome. But that's that's the thing. If you feel like grace is an opportunity to live more like hell, then you don't really understand what grace is. Yeah. You see, because grace is the covering that we live in every single day, even though we do live like hell. And what it is, it's a realization that I don't want to live like that anymore. Even though I know I'm loved, even when I do, my mind is renewed to the fact that that's not where I want to be. I understand that I have a second chance and a new opportunity at life. Why would I go back and do what I've already been doing that clearly isn't working? That's right. wow. But man, it's so freeing to know that even when I do mess up and fall and stumble... I'm still abounding in grace. Grace is not a slot machine here. Let me get my one ticket of grace for the day. We abound in grace in everything we do and everywhere we go. But it's renewing our mind to that truth, that the true understanding of grace, to understand the true love that God has for us, will, will want us to live differently. 
It will want us to say, well, there, there's, there's something more. I can, there's something more on the inside of me that I can do. And again, it's important that we know that we're not doing those things to gain love from God. We're doing those things because we already have yeah. eternal love from the Father. Right. Grace makes us focus on Jesus more. It should not make us focus on us more. And we get to verse 2. And he, it, this is right after he says that. He says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? And so Paul is making it very, very clear how can sin be something you're living in if you truly believe that you died with it when you accepted Jesus in your heart? Yeah. Because the truth of the matter is the moment you believe, you're associating yourself with Jesus' death and your death to your flesh. And you're associating yourself with Jesus' resurrection and the resurrection of ourselves in a new life. Right. Amen? Amen? That's the gospel. And so what he's saying is, how can we who died to sin live in it anymore? You see, it changes our relationship to sin Permanently, We have died to sin. Therefore, if we have died to sin, then we should not live any longer in it. It simply isn't fitting to live any longer in something you have died to. In Ephesians 2.1, we see that Christ rescued us while we were dead in our sin. And now it's important to note that we are dead to sin. You see, we're no longer in sin. You no longer live in sin when you have the renewed mind that you died with Jesus and you're resurrected again with him. On his behalf. So how can you die to something... How could sin reign over somebody that's already dead? It can't. And that's, the, that's what Paul even hits on in Galatians. It can't, it, it can't be over you anymore because you've died. And again, that only comes with the realization and a renewal of your mind and a belief in the gospel. And that comes at your salvation, believing. So let's continue on here. Verse 3 says, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus... Were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Most people will live their entire lives knowing that Christ died for them, and they will never have the realization that Christ died as them. <coughs> we should no longer be running in this rat race of life of feeling like we need to continually do something different to make our standing better or there's something that is required of us it's understanding that if you truly believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins was buried and three days late, later came alive and we believe that for us and what we believe is that we were also dead that it no longer has to do with us in the flesh but it has to do with who Jesus is and now when God looks at us, he looks at us through what Jesus did. Not what we could ever not do or do. What this does is it takes all of the pressure off of us and it allows us to live freely and dangerously for God. You see, there's no pressure. And a lot of people say, man, that's awesome. No pressure means I don't have to do as much. Well, again, if that's your mindset, then you don't have a true understanding and renewal of the truth. Because it shouldn't be, man, there's no pressure, so I don't really have to go to church. And I don't have to do it. You don't have to do any of those things. We can sit on the spiritual couch of life and we'll still go to heaven if we believe in who Jesus is in the gospel. And he loves us just the same. But that's not what he wants for us. What he wants for us, if my son sat at home every single day, you know, up until he's a certain age or whatever. I mean, yeah, I would eventually kick him out, but I would never stop loving him. He could sit on the couch every day and my love would never change for him. But that's not what my best intention for his life would be. The best intention for our life is to go out and be dangerous and to change the world for Jesus and to fail and to understand that we're still completely loved. Right. It's inevitable. It's understanding that this opportunity is right here in front of us. And so Jesus was the procreation of our sins. It's no longer me, but it's Christ in me. The hope of glory. And so this is where we get water baptisms from. This is why we do water baptisms. It's because it's an understanding that we are now identifying not with Sam, but with Jesus on my behalf. And I'm dying with him and, and uniting with him in his death and also in his resurrection. And it's something that's already happened on the inside of me. And it's an opportunity to show that to people around me. Hey, this change has already happened. I'm now identifying with it in the natural, something that's already taking place in the spiritual. 
In this regard, baptism is important as an illustration of spiritual reality, but it does not make that reality come to pass. If someone has not spiritually died and risen with Jesus, all the baptism in the world will not accomplish it for them. You see, baptism does not bring salvation. We get baptized because we have already received our salvation. And there's a lot of people that believe you have to be water baptized to be saved. And at the end of the day, that's not the truth. You see, you're baptized with Christ spiritually the moment you believe. In his death and in his resurrection. And then the water baptism is an opportunity to show an outward expression of an inward change. Amen? Am I making sense today? I hope so. If I'm not, I'm going to still talk. Verse 5, here we go. It says this. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, and we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. He makes it very clear. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Sin should no longer be what's holding us back from doing what God's called us to do. Because if we allow it to have power over our lives, it will. But the truth of the matter is it shouldn't, and it does not. And that's why it's important that we renew our minds to the truth daily. Because it happens to all of us. To me. I have to renew my mind and say, you know what? My mistakes are not holding me back from God using me. If they were, I would not be up here today. Because I have many. But it's an understanding that it, it does not have to do with my mistakes and what I've done. But a surrender and understanding to what Jesus has done on my behalf. Amen. United together, symphitos, I think that's how you say that, is the expression which occurs only here, this word, united together in the New Testament means to grow in union or to plant in union. The word describes two plants that have been planted together and are growing closely together, entwined or united. So if you've ever planted stuff uh, in, you know, when season comes, you plant and certain things will come up and they'll end up being entwined together, right? You, you'll you put something up so some of your beans or whatever you're planting can go up the, you know, and create vines. But a lot of times they entwine together. So what he's saying here is we are united together with Christ. That doesn't mean that Christ is some far off being that won't ever be here. What it means is we were planted together right next to him in his death and we were raised up in his resurrection and we are entwined with him. You see, there's nothing you can do once you believe that gets you untwined. Ever. We are united with Christ. I promise once we gain this understanding that there's nothing that could ever change that, our lives will radically change. Because it's the truth. Paul expressed a similar idea for his own life in Philippians 3, 10, and 11. He says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Some are all too ready to be united together in the glory of resurrection, but are unwilling to be united together in his death. It's important to realize that the moment we believe, our old man is dead. The moment you believe, the old man is dead. No matter if you wake up on Monday morning and you feel like that old man is back, that's not the case. No matter what wrongdoings you could ever do, the old man is never back, you see, because the old man was put to death. That's right. And it wasn't something that we ever did. So many times we feel like, man, you know, I, I got to kill the old man. And I got to do X, Y, and Z to, to finish the old man. You see, the old man was nailed to the cross the moment you believed when Jesus died, but it wasn't us who did it. God is the one who crucified our old man, not us. You see, so no action we could ever do could get us to crucify the old man. All we get to do is rest in the new man that was made by Jesus Christ and given to us by God. And so now we walk in newness of life, identifying with the new man and understanding that the old man is dead and can't ever come back. Amen? This is an all-inclusive gospel and understanding. We were buried with Christ. Our old man is gone. We were resurrected with him and given a new man. Amen? So let's talk about the old man for a second here. The death of the old man is an established fact. It happened spiritually when we were identified with Jesus' death at our salvation. So the moment that you believe, you're saved. 
And the moment you believe, your old man is dead. Because now you are no longer identifying with yourself, but you're identifying with Jesus' death on the cross. Does that make sense? So the old man is the self that is pat patterned after Adam. The part of us deeply ingrained in rebellion against God and his commands. You see, the system of law is unable to deal with the old man because it can only tell the old man what the righteous standard of God is. The law tries to reform the old man to get him to turn over a new leaf, but the system of grace understands that the old man can never be reformed. He must be put to death, and for the believer, the old man dies with Jesus on the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. So no matter how we feel, if you feel like, man, I've just done a whole lot of wrong, and I just feel like the old man is, you know, I'm, I'm living like the old. Hey, you could be feeling that way, but we don't walk by feeling. We walk by faith. Right. And we stand on the word and the truth, and we renew our minds to the truth daily, that the old man is dead. So now the new man reigns. The new man, which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness, we see in Ephesians 4, 24. The new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Colossians 3.10. I hit a button here. There we go. The two other places in the New Testament which mention the old man reminds us to consider him done away with. Telling us to put off the old man as something dead and gone. And strictly speaking, we don't battle the old man. We simply reckon him as dead. You see, we are not in a battle with our flesh and the old man. At the end of the day, we renew our minds and we just reckon him as dead because that's what he is. Amen? Amen. That's freedom. That's freeing to understand that this, this weight that we felt like we carried because of our actions or our mistakes. And then we feel like I've just been trying so hard to crucify my old man. And I'm uh, not my actual old man, but <laughs> crucify the old man. And we try, try, try. And it's just an understanding that the old man was crucified with Christ the moment you believed. So now what? So now what? what? What does this mean for us? It means that we get to walk in newness of life because of a good father who sent a perfect son who died for a sinful world. And we get to walk in newness of life. Amen? So verse 9, let's keep going here. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So death no longer reigns over our spiritual bodies or our mortal bodies. If you're in here today and you feel like God kills people to teach people a lesson or, you know, there was somebody that I talked to in the past and they said that they had a friend who was battling a sickness and they just felt like they heard God tell them that you're not going to get healed and you're going to die, but it's going to be for my glory. I want to tell you today that God would never say that. God does not kill. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come to bring life and life more abundantly. So anything to do with death and sickness and disease, is on, that's on the devil. That's on the enemy. But anything to do with life and life more abundantly, that's the God we serve. And he's so good that not only does our spiritual body come alive and have newness of life when we believe, but our mortal bodies. I'm going to give a little spoiler for a couple weeks. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, yeah. he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies yeah. through his spirit who dwells in you. So if you're battling a sickness, stand on this word. Stand on this verse. He not only has given me new life spiritually, but in my mortal body, in my flesh. Amen? We can praise God for that. And we can stand in the gap for some people that don't have the truth of this understanding. We can say no matter what you think about, about God, about our Father, I'm telling you today, He wants a life for us. He wants a life for our children. If you have kids or grandkids, when have you ever wanted them to get a sickness or a disease so they learned a lesson? And if that's us, and we're a bunch of jacked up people and parents, then how much better is God? God not only gave us the opportunity to walk in spiritual life, but he gives us the opportunity in our mortal bodies as well. Charles Spurgeon said, if God has given you and me an entirely new life in Christ, how can that new life spend itself after, fashion, after the same fashion of the old life? Shall the spiritual live as the carnal? How can you that were the servants of sin but have been made free by precious blood go back to your old slavery? 
And it's a, it's a mindset, it's an understanding that the moment you believe, you're walking in newness of life. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to remind ourselves. Like I said, a lot of times we can get to this rut, into this place where we feel and we start letting the enemy lie to us. That somehow we are far from God. Somehow maybe these things aren't necessarily true, but it's the renewal of the truth. Everything should come back to the word. And the first question that my dad would ever ask me, if I was ever battling anything spiritually or, or going through anything, the first thing he would ask me is, are you in your word? That is the basis of everything that we have ever lived our lives off of. Are you in your word? And I can tell you right now when we're in our word and we're, we're renewing our minds and we're having conversation with our father, we will see things start to change. So if you're in that place, you're like, man, I just feel like nothing's going right. It just isn't making sense. I encourage you. If you don't have a Bible, we can provide you with one, but open it and see what God has to say. Hear what he has to say. Stop listening to what we have to say and listen to what he has to say. So what now? What does this next year look like? I, I, I wanted to kind of cap this off, and it kind of goes off of what Blake and I were talking about last week. What does this look like? Because a year went by like that. It felt like yesterday. I remember the morning that my dad actually called me and told me that my grandpa passed away. It was Sunday morning last year, and I had to come to church and preach, and I was really mad at him. I was like, why wouldn't you just wait till after service? Because that was definitely the hardest thing I ever had to do. And then I, we go to California for the, the funeral, and I realized that that same Sunday, he left and he didn't preach. And I was like, so I had to preach, knowing that, you know, Grandpa passed, but, you know, you, you didn't. But, but again, just like that, boom, a year is gone. And we have seen tremendous impact in this community, in this community right here, this family sitting around and we've seen God do miraculous. We've seen people healed. And it's been amazing. So what now? Like Blake was saying, we made it to one year, but, but let's think about legacy. Yes. Let's think about what our children and their children and their children are, are going to be doing in this community, in this building, outside of these walls, because of what they knew about their father when they were little. It's the reason we have a generation of people that are disenfranchised from church and Christianity because they were raised as little kids that God was angry with them. He was mad at them. There are requirements they had to fulfill. And now we see a generation of people out of the church. Because who would want any of that? I wouldn't want any of that. It's garbage. And it's lies. But it's important. And we should understand that as parents and grandparents and family in this room. That we're teaching our children and this next generation and the generation after them who God really is. And that's what our grandpa always did, and it's a legacy. You see, the legacy starts to trickle down. And now, guess what? We'll never believe the lie that somebody down the street will tell you about who God is. Because I know who my father is. And the moment I know on my revelation of who my God is, you can't say anything about it. And I know the truth of who he is. Amen? And so that's the task that we have in front of us. I'm sure everybody in this room is praying and believing for something in their life, no matter what it is. And we're saying, God, I just, I want to see this thing happen. I'm just praying and believing, whether it's for a new job or for a relationship or your marriage or finances or your children, whatever it is. We heard last week a couple different couples, and, and it's crazy how it all lined up, but multiple different couples have mentioned, without talking, that they were waiting between eight and nine years. And they felt like us planting this church here and God doing this was the answer to that prayer. I mean, I can tell you right now, I don't remember the last time I've ever waited that long for anything. And we, and we live in a world today that's a have it now. I want this now. I'm going to get it now. And a lot of times when we would say maybe God spoke to us and said, hey, you know, uh, like Blake was saying, they, they, they knew the community that God was calling them to and they just hadn't found it yet. And I can tell you if that were me, I would have said, well, let's just go try to do it ourselves. Let's just go. I guess we're just moving. We're just going to maybe 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 we weren't really hearing from God. And the enemy could come in and lie and attack. But what's so interesting is within those eight and nine years. Of many families waiting. They weren't just sitting, you know, twiddling their thumbs waiting. In the waiting, they were preparing for what was to come. And so when it finally came, they could contain all that God was doing. It's so important that, yeah, we might not get what God has promised us right away. But in that time of waiting, it's important that we prepare ourselves to contain all that he's going to do. Does that make sense? 
I want to right now prepare myself for what God is going to do X amount of years down the line because I want to be able to hold all that he's going to give me. So it's important that we know what does this next year look like? It looks like maybe God, maybe we haven't seen the manifestation of the promise. But what are we doing to be prepared when it comes? Number one, focus on the message that we are called to preach. It's so important that we stay focused on what God called us here to do. And that's not just us. That's every single person in this room. He's called us to preach the truth of the gospel. He's called us not to tarnish his name and to lie to people. But he's called us to tell the truth of who he is and the truth of who every, every one of his children is. Amen? Yeah. Ephesians 4.14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And for, for, for far too often we've seen that in the church. Because it's people. God is using people. But again, if, we're, if we have a false understanding of who the Father is, we're going to have a false understanding of who we are in his house. And we're going to give a wrong revelation of who he is to people. And that's not what God has called us to do. God's called us here to preach the truth. And not, there's not one thing that you'll ever hear anybody up here say that you can't find in the word. The truth of who God is. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. I'm sure there's countless people in this room today that have been burned by church or been in a church that have heard fake news, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, that's the, and that's the truth. But that's why it's so important that we don't live off of the revelation of a pastor, but we live off the revelation that we have of our Father with us. But I promise you that this next year, what it looks like for us in this family is that we are going to continue preaching the truth of the gospel. And it's not going to get any easier. It's, it's really easy preaching truth because it has nothing to do with me. It's just the word. But I'm telling you what, the enemy doesn't like that. The enemy wants people to be in bondage. They want people enslaved to the yoke of slavery and believing lies about who God is. So it's important that we understand that us as a body in this room today, we have been tasked with something to preach the truth. And the truth will set you free. That does not mean that everybody will like it. We see that in our world today. But the truth will set you free. Amen? Amen? Number two, and lastly, as we close today, this next year, we are going to focus on the community that we are called to reach. So not only the community of the people in this room and here, but the community that God has placed us in, of Quitman, Arkansas, the region of central Arkansas. Because this truth is radical. This freedom is radical. If you've been in this room before and this is the first time you've, you've realized the truth of the gospel, it's radical. And it's awesome. And the gospel of grace is dangerous because it sets people free. But we're going to be dangerous anyways. Amen? Like we said last week, the, the burden of us preaching the gospel of grace, what people do with that, that's not our burden to bear. But our burden is to bear the truth of the gospel and to preach the truth. That's what God has called us to do. So quickly, I'm just going to talk about the importance of community, the community that we're called to reach. This is from the CDC website, and it says this. This was the title of the page, Loneliness and Social Isolation Linked to Serious Health Conditions. Social isolation significantly increased a person's risk to premature death from all causes, a risk that may rival those of smoking, obesity, and physical activity. Social isolation was associated with about 50% of increased, increased risk of dementia, poor social relationships, characterized by social isolation or loneliness, was associated with a 29% increased risk of heart disease and a 32% increased risk of stroke. Wow. Loneliness was associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. Loneliness among heart failure patients was associated with nearly four times increased risk of death, 68% increased risk of hospitalization, and 57% increased risk of emergency department visits. This is from the same people that wanted us to stay home and isolated for two years. Yeah. And on their website, all of the things that are linked to depression and loneliness, the enemy wants you alone. I'm going to tell you right now, the devil wants nothing 
anything other for you than to be alone and not with the community. A big reason people don't have community is because they once had community surrounded by the wrong doctrine. That's the reason that people no longer want community, and that's the community that God has called us to. There's a lot of people out there that don't want anything to do with God or religion or any of it, and I don't blame them. But it's because they were burned by a community of people that were surrounded by the wrong doctrine and were telling lies about who our Father is. But we have a task here as Hope Family Church, and that's to love people to life. That is to share the truth of the love that God has for them. Despite what they've done or where they are. Or if they go to our church or not. Hello, somebody. When you're in the right community, the best of what God has put in you starts to come out. And if, you're, if you've been in this community and you feel like it's the right one for you, you know that's true. Because when there's a group of people that understand that we're all messed up and we're all jacked up, but we understand that we are surrounded by the word, truth, and life, and freedom the best of what God has called and put in us is going to start to come out because we're empowered. Because we're no longer living under a yoke of slavery, which Jesus took to the cross. Yeah. We're living renewed to the truth that we can be exactly who God called us to be. And we can be that in this community. And we need to be that for this community. Right. You see, because God did not call us to be us for no more and to sit here and say, well, sorry, sucks for you. But hey, there's a truth in this word that you carry around. And the truth is that you're completely loved based on what Jesus did for you. And there is nothing you could ever do that would separate you from the love of God. Amen. 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 Father, we honor you today and we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for who you've always been. And we thank you that you have called us to such a time as this. We thank you that you have called us to this city for a reason, to be dangerous for the kingdom of God, to preach a gospel of grace that is dangerous because it sets people free. And today, God, we honor you and we thank you. We ask you, what can I do? What can I do in this community? What can I do with the gifts and the talents and the business ideas and the heart that you've given me? What can I do? to love people to life, to help share this gospel. We thank you that we live off of the legacy of who you are. And we thank you for the opportunity that we get to leave a legacy on this earth. And the way people will remember us is a bunch of people that knew how good God was. So we honor you and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise.